Some games are memorable because they're great. Some games are memorable because they're awful. And some games are memorable because the history behind them is so fascinating. Hong Kong 97 is a game that fits into two of these three categories. I'll refrain from saying which two. For those who are learning about Hong Kong 97 for the very first time, it was an unlicensed Super Nintendo or Super Famicom game that came out in 1995, when the console was still in its prime. So few copies were made that hardly anyone got a chance to play it or even know of its existence, until it gradually started appearing on emulators years later, and then shot to fame when it was reviewed by the angry video game nerd. But as his statement indicated, it's so rare that to this day, not a single cartridge or physical copy has shown up at all. No one actually knew where the game had come from, or for that matter if it had ever existed in physical form. However, a supposed physical copy surfaced in early 2018, and after some heavy skepticism from the gaming community, it was eventually shown to be one of the original copies of Hong Kong 97. It's time to answer all the questions surrounding one of the most mysterious games in history. Based on an interview with the creator himself, I offer you the complete history of Hong Kong 97. The story begins with an underground journalist named Kowloon Kurosawa. This, of course, is a pen name. Kowloon is taken from the name of a district in Hong Kong. And whether he can be called a bona fide journalist or not is a judgment I'll leave to the viewer. Mr. Kurosawa's journey to becoming the father of the worst game ever began with his love for computers. He bought his first PC at 14 years old, with borrowed money of course. This was an era when the average person still didn't know how to use a computer, so a junior high school student having his own was quite an accomplishment. With a mere two months to pay back the loan, he quickly taught himself the very basics of programming and sold some floppy disks labeled as games at Comic Market. Although realistically, the contents were primitive compilations of text with some images, nothing that could remotely be called a game. Not a good way to build a fan base. Despite this, he continued to work on his coding skills and managed to make a name for himself several years later in 1988 with a simple adventure game called Gomon Master, or literally Torture Master, which he also sold at Comic Market. This time, the game sold enough copies to generate a bit of interest among computer nerds, and thankfully, at least one video of gameplay has been preserved. As an adult, Mr. Kurosawa's love of electronics and underground tech devices often found him rummaging through computer shops in Hong Kong and Southeast Asia. During one of his travels in Hong Kong, while looking for copied Amiga games, he discovered an accessory for the Super Famicom which would come to be referred to as a Magicon. It sat on top of the console with a space to insert a game cartridge on top and a floppy disk drive on the side. With the device, you could copy the data from a game onto a floppy disk and then play the game straight from the disk without the cartridge. Basically, a piracy device. Considering that new Super Famicom games often cost 9,000 yen or around $90, it was a good investment if you weren't concerned about walking on thin ice with copyright laws. Eventually, he started importing the Magicons to Japan and selling them at a profit. It would be just one of countless shady endeavors Mr. Kurosawa took on during his career. Piracy was highly looked down on in Japan at the time, and in the early 90s, Nintendo had an iron grip on the console gaming market there. It was illegal to sell unlicensed games, since software that appeared on the Super Famicom would be associated with the Nintendo brand, and they wanted to maintain a family-friendly image. Taking this into account, the customer base was limited, but it was lucrative enough to continue for several years. But one day, he got a cease and desist letter from Nintendo, claiming that Magicons were infringing on their copyright for the cartridge shape of the Super Famicom. And Mr. Kurosawa decided it wasn't worth the trouble to continue circumventing the law. He was out of the Magicon business. Thankfully, selling Magicons wasn't his only means of making a living. During this time, Mr. Kurosawa had also begun writing anecdotes about his travels and encounters with weird people or dangerous situations. He published books full of stories about prostitution, drugs, low-level criminals, and anything that seemed vulgar or sensational, a reflection of his passion for the path less traveled. His books tend to look like shrunken down tabloids, and it's hard to say whether they are the testimony of a worldly traveler or cheap trite meant to play on people's stereotypes that mainland Asia is this primitive and lawless place. 
it may very well be that Mr. Kurosawa's unique talent is bringing these two worlds together. At some point, a person who had been a fan of Mr. Kurosawa's writing and games contacted him, suggesting they make a game together and sell it in floppy disk format. The person in question had done programming work for several major game companies, including Square and Enix, and for this reason, Mr. Kurosawa can't reveal his name. This seemingly harmless idea would prove to be the seed which grew into one of the most infamous projects in gaming history. The two hit it off, and it was decided Mr. Kurosawa would produce the idea for the game, while the mystery programmer would put it all together into a working product. While Mr. Kurosawa had done some very limited programming of computer games, the Super Famicom was far out of his league, so this was an opportunity to do something big. His idea? Make the foulest, most offensive game the world had ever seen. Ignore all copyright laws, ethics, and expectations for game design. The story for the game would be about the reunification of Hong Kong with mainland China. Exemplifying the negative stereotype that Chinese people are crude and unruly compared to their more sophisticated Hong Kongese counterparts, the dilemma was that the influx of mainland Chinese would sully the landscape and society of Hong Kong. In the face of this disaster, a hero would appear to protect Hong Kong by killing the entire population of communist China. Good old-fashioned genocide. To build on the utterly tasteless premise, Digitized graphics of real people would be used without their permission. In the opening story sequences, the main character, Chin, who is supposedly a relative of Bruce Lee, is depicted as Jackie Chan. Images of Bruce Lee and the Prime Minister of Hong Kong also appear, and the final boss of the game was the severed head of Deng Xiaoping, a former Chinese politician, now reworked into a biomechanical superweapon. And as if to challenge the fates themselves, the game over screen would be a digitized picture of a real dead body with gunshot wounds. By his own account, Mr. Kurosawa spent approximately three hours picking out the graphics to be used in Hong Kong 97 and converting them into raw data. They were mostly taken from things he had lying around. The picture of the body used at the game over screen came from a video compilation of footage of people dying, similar to the Faces of Death movies. The song used for the background music was a six-second sample from a laser disc he had with Chinese music on it. Pictures of Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee were taken from movie covers or promotional pictures. Possibly the most impractical decision, yet the one that ended up having the most impact, was to include multiple language options. Mr. Kurosawa asked a friend with some proficiency in English to translate the story, and an exchange student from Hong Kong to provide a Chinese translation. Once everything was ready, he sent the data to his programmer friend, who then wrote up a simple program and put everything into place. The game was an endless single-screen shooter with only two or three enemy patterns. Background graphics were randomly chosen images of Chinese ads or propaganda, and the six-second loop of Chinese propaganda turned pop music played indefinitely as long as the game was on. Hopefully it goes without saying that this was a completely haphazard project and could never reasonably be called a business endeavor. The story sequence leading up to the game was just as offensive as Mr. Kurosawa had hoped, telling the player in no uncertain terms the goal of the game is to kill every single person from mainland China. But the game itself was so awful it can barely even be called a video game. Even if you acknowledge the fact that the project was just one big joke and more a form of black humor than a vehicle for entertainment, few people would willingly pay money for such a product and feel satisfied. But that's just what Mr. Kurosawa expected people to do. He whipped up a graphic image for the game to be printed on a postcard with just as little care as the rest of the game had been given, again cutting and pasting images he had lying around at home, and wrote an article about the game which doubled as an advertisement for a magazine about game copy devices called Game Labo. In order to buy it, you had to get a money order from the post office and mail it to a P.O. box that Mr. Kurosawa was renting. This is the very same address shown on the graphic insert that came with the game. His memory is a little hazy, but the price was either 2,000 or 2,500 yen, or 20 to 25 US dollars. Now remember, 
Not only was it technically illegal to make and sell Super Famicom games without Nintendo's approval, but the disc copier machines needed to actually play the game had also been deemed illegal in Japan after Nintendo caught wind of them. So one small ad in an underground magazine was the only method Mr. Kurosawa had to reach his audience. On top of all that, the reason a person would buy a Magicon in the first place was to copy games for free, or nearly for free. They were already circumventing the law because they didn't want to pay for games. With an already limited audience of the least likely people to buy a game they knew nothing about, Hong Kong 97 sold extremely poorly. By his own account, somewhere in the neighborhood of a mere 30 copies. He had already printed several hundred copies of the graphic insert, but after it became clear there wouldn't be any more orders, he scrapped them. As any rational person could have predicted, Hong Kong 97 was a commercial failure, and it's hard to imagine Mr. Kurosawa was expecting anything more. The game would have slipped into obscurity had it not been for the advent of the internet, and, most importantly, emulators. As home computers became more powerful and internet speeds increased, we discovered as a community that video game hardware could be replicated on a computer, along with the console's games, and thus a technological and moral can of worms was opened that has polarized the gaming industry to this day. It's beyond the scope of this video to go into whether emulators have helped or hurt gaming, and whether using them is right or wrong. The only thing you need to know is, emulated versions of Hong Kong 97 appeared. Since there were so few copies floating around, it's hard to say how it happened, but the game was just data on a floppy disk to begin with, so it wouldn't have been difficult. As obscure Japanese games became more accessible to the average person, gamers keen on trying out odd-sounding titles sometimes ran into Hong Kong 97 and were appalled at how bad it was. Thanks to the inclusion of the English language option, there was essentially no language barrier, and the tasteless, offensive storyline was on parade for all to see. It became something of a myth in gaming circles. The company that supposedly made it, HappySoft, had seemingly never existed, and unless you could read Japanese and had serious internet sleuthing skills, there was essentially no information on the game. Most importantly, there were no copies for sale anywhere, and not a single picture of a physical copy. It was only a matter of time before a game this bad would be picked up by the man who we all rely on for playing the worst games so that we don't have to. The Angry Video Game Nerd. After receiving countless requests to review Hong Kong 97, AVGN released his video on the game in 2015, elevating it from a rumor on internet forums to a legend of obscure games. It went from being known by several thousand people to several million people nearly overnight, and Hong Kong 97 was now on the level of things like Bigfoot or Polybius. This gave rise to a bit of a problem. Eventually, people discovered that a man known as Kowloon Kurosawa had developed the game. After making Hong Kong 97, Mr. Kurosawa had moved to Cambodia and returned to his work of traveling to seedy places and writing sensational stories about the dregs of society, being the hard-working adult that he is. He had all but forgotten about his magnum opus. But now, people began contacting him on his social media accounts. They wanted to know where they could get a copy, who the development team was, and, to Mr. Kurosawa's distress, who the dead body was in the game over screen. Sometimes he would receive 10 inquiries in a single day. He clearly never could have imagined the appeal this type of macabre would have to the English-speaking world. Mr. Kurosawa attempted once or twice to engage with some of the people contacting him, but the sheer number was overwhelming, and a lot of the inquiries were garbled nonsense passed through Google Translate or didn't comprehend the gravity of the subject matter. A lot of people didn't seem to understand that it was a crime to have made the game, and giving out names of other people involved in the project would have been thoughtless and even dangerous. And while it's hard to say whether publishing a picture of a dead person without their family's permission is a crime or not, it's the highest taboo in nearly any human society. After a while, Mr. Kurosawa decided there was nothing to be gained from trying to interact with the legions of people begging him to reveal the secrets of Hong Kong 97, and he simply chose to ignore them. The fact was, it wasn't advancing his career or bringing in any revenue. It just wasn't the kind of impact he had hoped to make. Hong Kong 97 could have just as easily remained a mystery to English-speaking gamers forever. But then, a miracle happened, and I consider myself lucky to have been a part of it. 
I had learned of Hong Kong 97 from the angry video game nerd like most people, and I had even tried contacting Mr. Kurosawa in Japanese once, but I certainly wasn't on a quest to find a supposed physical copy which may or may not have existed. However, one day in early 2018 when I was browsing the Super Famicom section of Yahoo Auctions, I came across something calling itself Hong Kong 97. When I first saw it, I thought the same thing most other people would think. Yeah, right. The thing is, there was nothing to compare it against. No one really knew what a complete copy looked like. It was a floppy disk with what looked like a small instruction booklet, and the Japanese Wikipedia article stated that it had been distributed on floppy disks. The description was sparse and unassuming, but the seller had a perfect score, and the starting bid was only 1,000 yen, or around $10. I figured that, if it did happen to be real, the chance would almost certainly never show itself again. So, I made my decision. If it sold for $500 or less, I would buy it. And when it ended, I was the winner at 35,500 yen, or around 320 US dollars. In my mind at least, I was the owner of the only known copy of Hong Kong 97. A few days later, the game arrived and looked exactly as it had in the pictures on the auction. I discovered what I thought had been an instruction booklet was actually a single postcard with graphics printed on both sides. At the time, I had only been making videos for about six months, and I rushed to make a video showing off my discovery. This was it! The legendary Hong Kong 97, visible for the first time ever on the internet. Unfortunately, reception to the video wasn't all positive. A lot of people were turned off by my giddiness, and I didn't say where I had bought it. In hopes of salvaging my reputation, I made a follow-up, saying I had bought the game on an auction and offered screenshots of the conversation I'd had with the seller. I even bought a few of Mr. Kurosawa's books and read excerpts from them, which were often just as foul as his games. But the first video had left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths, and it just didn't make the kind of impact I had hoped for. While I was personally convinced of the game's authenticity, there was still the issue of whether it could be played or not, so a few months later, I decided I would buy a Magicon and figure out once and for all whether or not the game could actually be played. I had to order one from Europe since they aren't very common in Japan, and it must have gotten banged up in transit a bit, because when it arrived, it wouldn't play regular cartridges or the Hong Kong 97 disc. This turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I figured the best person to ask about how to get it working would be the man who made a game intended to be played on it, Kowloon Kurosawa himself. I sent him a message on Instagram explaining the situation, and luckily he mailed me back. Before the conversation could progress much further, a person on a Facebook gaming group helped me to get the Magicon working again, and to my amazement, the game started up in all its hideous glory. It was official. I had a working, physical copy of Hong Kong 97. I quickly made a video showing that the game worked, and I must have tagged Mr. Kurosawa's name in a post about it somewhere, because he mailed me saying he had seen the video and confirmed that it was, indeed, one of the legendary original copies of Hong Kong 97. This has been an amazing journey for me, quite possibly the highlight of my life as a gamer. I eventually asked Mr. Kurosawa if he would meet with me and explain the entire story behind the game, and he agreed, which is what led to the video you're watching now. He was extremely kind, and even refused to accept payment for the interview. Some people may remember that I had introduced another game supposedly worked on by Kowloon Kurosawa in one of my videos about Hong Kong 97. The game was Minisuke Police for the PlayStation 2, an official release of all things. And at the end of the interview, I discovered that not only had Mr. Kurosawa worked on the game, but he had made it together with the very same person he made Hong Kong 97 with. Minisuke Police is the closest we will ever get to having a spiritual sequel to Hong Kong 97. So concludes the story of one of the worst, and yet most intriguing video games the world has ever laid eyes on. And to the people wondering who the person is at the Game Over screen, he doesn't know. He never knew. It was taken from a regular VHS sold at a store, not some underground snuff film. If you desperately want to see people dying, there are videos out there with that kind of footage on them. It isn't unprecedented. When I was a kid, they were out in the recommended viewing section of the video rental shop. 
it's time for all of us, myself included, to let it go. There is no answer to that question, and it isn't that important in the grand scheme of things. So let's all be grateful that we're here, among the living, and try not to let the urge to chase after death impede that.